Well, I think that there is more awareness now about the topic of embodiment, and that's really big in intimacy coaching is, you know, helping people learn to get more into their bodies because we're so in our heads <laughs> using the breath. I'm laughing with right? you. <laughs> and, and, you know, even being able to feel more empowered and making the right choices for ourselves because, you know, we have a lot of sort of social constructs and conditioning that kind of guides the way we think. And being more in your body can help you sort of uncover those beliefs that may not be working for you anymore. Hello, I'm Craig Constantine. Welcome to the Movers Mindset Podcast, where I talk with movement enthusiasts to learn who they are, what they do, and why they do it. This episode is with Maggie Spallus, Coaching Journey, Transitions, and Consulting. For Maggie Spallus, transitioning from coaching parkour into coaching relationships and intimacy felt like a natural progression. She discusses her connection to parkour and how it's evolved from mom to coach to business consultant. Maggie shares her thoughts on coaching and her transition into relationship and intimacy coaching. She describes her work on Kiskea Athletics and how she stays passionate about parkour and giving back to the community. Maggie Spallus is a coach, project manager, and mover. She has over 10 years of coaching experience, including certifications as a personal trainer, parkour instructor, behavioral change specialist, and relationship coach. Maggie is also project manager for Kiskea Athletics, a multi-sport facility currently under construction in South Texas. Maggie splits her time between managing the development of Kiskea Athletics and helping people build stronger relationships and deeper intimacy. For more information, go to moversmindset.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening. What was the first thing that you thought when we reached out to you and said, hey, we want to do a podcast recording for Movers Mindset? What's the first thing? Because I know there was a little, there was a little, I don't want to say resistance, but there was a little like, (laughs) me? You want to talk? Yeah. What was, what was the first thing that you were thinking when we said we want to talk to you? You want to interview me? That's what I thought. (laughs) <laughs> well, so, all right, let's dive into imposter syndrome. No, I, I'm, I'm not going to make it into a therapy session, <laughs> although I could, I could use therapy. Why, why do you think that, so, so you're kind of known as mom, Maggie? Or, or, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I, you know, I'm a parkour mom. I, no shame in that. I, I wasn't it. trying to, but I, I'm like, what is it? Have you always been the, let's say the mother duckling or the mother goose or, or is I that? I think so. Yeah, I, I do. And I like it. You know, I started out working out working at the parkour gym just at the front desk. Mm-hmm. And that was even before I started practicing parkour. I just love the place. I love what it did for my kids. And it felt kind of like a home away from home. And so that's how it started, mm-hmm. really. I loved the people who I worked with. Like I just looked forward to going to work just to hang out with them. There were loads of fun and yeah, and and I liked the hustle bustle and you know talking moms off the cliff and <laughs> <laughs> you know stuff like that. I did. Did they? When you say talking off the cliff, you mean when the moms come to class or when the moms are like, "Oh, I'm going to drop my kid off and could I have him back in one piece?" Oh, like God, I just there's just I mean you probably know, but there's just just when you think you've experienced everything. There's always like another thing that happens, you know, just crazy stuff. But uh, yeah, I almost want to say something, but maybe it's just too gross, but like gross things that happen and just like, but yeah, you know, somebody gets hurt because they were stepping off of the crash pad and weren't paying attention. And, you know, the parents freaking out or, (laughs) you know, freaking out because, not getting along with another kid or there's like a billing issue or somebody said something to somebody else. I mean, even my own son, Ben, who was one of the wild kids. I mean, he was one of those that were, where they were always saying, slow down, pay attention, you know, like you have more power than control, that kind of thing. The only time he got like injured in a way that sidelined him was he was just bending over to look at a bug and he tripped on the mat. And, you know, he was out for like, you know, kind of fractured his elbow and he was out for like, got like eight months or something. But yeah, I mean, most of the accidents, I think, at least in my experience, have been not because of parkour, but just people not paying attention, crashing into each other, you know, 
goofing off on the trampoline. Did, kind of so, thing. Uh, I'm like, did you know what parkour was when you applied for no. the job? Or you just like, Oh no. Well, okay. I didn't know what parkour was. I just knew that my son got invited to a birthday party. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I picked him up, you know, at the time my son was a struggling learner. He, anything that I would sign him up for, I wasted so much money because he'd last like maybe two, three classes. And then I had to pull him out because he just wouldn't, wasn't paying attention, wasn't interested. And, uh, but he went to this parkour birthday party and was like, mom, I want to do this. I want to do this. And, and I remember going to the website of the place and at the time I was very complicated by the website. And then I kind of like gave up on it. it was so busy. And then I went back to look it up again. And then I signed him up for a class. He went to the intro class. He loved it. And then he got into this habit of going to like the first class at five and like staying until like nine or 10. Cause he oh. would be like, you know, All level in. one and then tricking and free running and then break dancing. And then, you know, like a martial arts thing and, or a, like a open gym. And so, and then my daughters ended up going too, because I didn't have any childcare. So I kind of dragged them along, but they took a class nearby and I was driving around. And then finally they kind of got into parkour because there was also silks there and then they got into silks. And so I was there all the time, just sitting in the waiting area. And one of the owners just noticed that I was always there. You know, if you if you come sit over here, yeah, I'll give you money. <laughs> exactly. She was like, I had three memberships I was paying for. Her, and she was like, well, hey, you know, since you're here all the time during our peak hours, would you be interested in working the front desk? And, you know, you can shave off some of the cost of, you know, your kids going here. I was like, sure. So I started working at the front desk and um, and I enjoyed that. And then... The, but um, I'm guessing you were never thinking I, I too will be jumping on things. Like, do you remember the first moment where you thought maybe I should go on the other other side of the desk and go? Yeah. Well, the thing is that I used to. I was a gymnast when I was younger. I was a real jock. I was in all the sports in high school. But after having, ki- I just went through a long spell where I wasn't really doing anything active. I would like sign up for gym memberships, but I was so bored going to the gyms because I've always been kind of on a team or something when I was in school. So it looked really fun to me, but I didn't think I could do it. And then they had a class called 401 PK for people (laughs) over, (laughs) over. I'm noticing this, this story is blending into other stories that I've been going, keep going 401 PK. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who are under 30, that's a reference to retirement accounts. Yeah. We'll just let's put that out there. (laughs) And it it drives my husband crazy because when I'm actually talking about the real 401k, I call it a 401pk. (laughs) And he'd be like, you're talking about the 401k, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they had that class and uh, there was like a Mother's Day class for moms to join. So I went to that class and um, it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. And, um, so, you know, long story short, I started training with the coaches because I expanded my hours and I was even going there during the day when the kids were at school to help out because we had homeschool classes. And so um, when I went earlier in the day, I would train when the coaches were training because there would be like a block of time between the homeschool classes mm-hmm. and then when the after school classes starts and that's when the coaches would train. And so I would just hang out with them and train and learn stuff and and I ended up really liking it. And then I started taking classes too. And and then there was one period where like I was the only one training there because Ben had broken his elbow and the girls had moved on to other stuff and they were only coming for silks. Mm-hmm. And so I was training there more than anybody else. And then I decided to do the, um, I end, so this is funny. They had this task called the green band test on a whim the way that they arranged the tests were that it had to be scheduled and three coaches had to be there and it was like clipboards and a really like deep test. And like (laughs) one of the coaches would come from the other location. It was like a big ordeal. And uh, the student, one of the students didn't show up for the test, but they, they had already had the other coaches come from the other locations to do the test. And so I said, well, can I just do it just for fun, just to see if I could pass, but just for fun. And I ended up passing. And uh, so I got my green band. And what was funny, because it's a, it was a scary test. And a lot of people would be like too scared to take the test. But then after I got my green band, I was wearing the green band and I would check kids in 
you know? Mm-hmm. And they'd be like, you got a green band, you know? <laughs> and they're like, they're thinking if I got the green band, then they could get the green band. So then we started getting more people testing because it was kind of like, well, if the mom behind the desk could get the green band, then like, you know, some of these teens and even young adults were too scared to take the test. So then, so then other office people were taking the test and then we got more people matriculating to green band. And then it's um, funny how, yeah. like, if somebody goes first, it's like, then everybody goes. Yeah. You know, like they're probably thinking, you know, in hindsight, we should just give you that band on day one. It's just wear this. And when they say, did you, you just say yes, but <laughs> not to belittle the achievement. But I think there's something to be said for when you reach a certain age, you, you're like, give a shit filter kind of goes away. Yeah. You're just kind of like, do I want to do this or do I not want to do it? This seems interesting or it doesn't seem interesting. And I, I kind of suspected, I, I knew a little bit of that story. And I kind of suspected, I'm like, oh, let's let's unpack that story to start. Because I, th- I think people, well, if anybody listens, it's really interesting when you get a chance to hear someone tell the whole story of like their parkour origin story. Because it's, well, first of all, it's, you don't expect it unless you know them. But it's interesting for people who run gyms to see like, well, how did this start? Well, somebody invited Ben to a birthday party. Yeah. I.e., this is completely out of your control. Exactly. It's like you have no, so it's just like, hmm, it's a numbers game. Like how many birthday parties mm-hmm. or, or whatever the thing is that's so drawing people in. It's just, you have to just expose, you know, countless or large numbers of people to the thing you're trying to sell or parkour. And yeah. then some of them it will stick to. Some people will fall in love with it. Yeah. That's really I think I like. especially for the kids who just didn't really feel like they fit in with the more conventional mainstream stream sports that a lot of parents you know, would try their kids in, you know, the martial arts and the regular, you know, football or basketball or swimming and, you know, mm. all the stuff at the rec centers, you know, <laughs> that's like you try <laughs> all the classes school, right? at the rec centers, right? But parkour was something I think that both even though I wasn't doing it when I started my son in it, I loved watching it. And I was really into just being a mom there. I really loved it. And I just loved being in the space. I just loved being there. Mm. And the music blaring and, you know, the kids all running around. And I just loved it. Yeah. The the look of, like, I freeze up and guests think, did, did he crash? Like, what happened? <laughs> it's like, no, too many things to choose from. I want to ask about your your coaching that you do like which came which came first your your passions like i'm wondering how how, so here's the actual question i'm wondering (laughs) how your passion that you developed and discovered for movement i'm wondering how that changed the way that you coach if it did i'm I'm always guessing when and i'm like but to ask the question i need to know like the time frame so i'll just ask the question like was there do you see a change looking back do you see a change in how you coach as you went through that movement growth? Yeah, I think that, so I started, I got certified at that gym and then I started teaching classes and then I decided to become a personal trainer because I was doing some private coaching. And so I went through the NASM certification and became a personal trainer. And then when we moved to North Carolina, we have this really great addition to the house and I turned it into a little gym and decided that I would take on personal training clients. So I did personal training in my house while Ben transitioned to the parkour gym out here. And, and then I taught a class there. And during this time, I was noticing that it's not hard to train people who already are kind of strong and motivated and want to kind of get fit, but the people who could really use it were the ones who just, I I didn't know how to get them to stick with it. You know, I'm going to kind of say they're kind of like Ben, right? They had to find the thing that sparks joy. Yeah, possibly. But I also think it's a little different with adulthood because it's also kind of freeing up that space and interest for it because there's, you know, if you're parenting or your job or so on, uh, there's just a lot of distractions, right? And, you know, especially with people who, you know, were kind of at risk and needed more movement in their lives, with um, had some health risks. I, I really wanted to understand how to help people who, who also needed it as a matter of like longevity and, you know, overcoming certain health risks. And so I went to get the... Um, 
behavior change specialist certification because, you know, when you're a personal trainer, every two years you have to get continuing Continuing education. Continuing right? Yeah, so I decided to do that, and I thought it was really interesting, and that's just sparked an interest in life coaching because the whole behavior change specialist certification could also kind of qualify you to do what is called life coaching, wellness coaching, and so on. So, and I got really interested in this particular podcast led by a feminist life coach. And so I ended up doing this life coaching program with with her. And I started to get interested in life coaching, but I still felt like there was something missing about it. So I ended up becoming interested in more of a specialization in relationships and intimacy. And when I embarked on that training, I was like, this is it. This is totally what I want to do. And it's interesting because I don't feel like it's that, it feels more close to my world when I was involved in parkour, being a parkour mom, working at parkour gyms and coaching and so on. Because the thing that I really liked about parkour was the community and the intimacy. I think that there, you know, with, with jams and even with classes and open gyms and so on, that there's a certain sort of a camaraderie and community. Definitely. Yep. You know, with all in the, the good ones. I yeah. mean, there are bad examples, but generally, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and even like the national and global community with, you know, exchanging videos and the social media and so on. I think there's a certain closeness and um, intimacy that evolves. And I think what's really nice is that it's also, um, I think that it's so comfortable that people are, are comfortable with being vulnerable too. And so, you know, I see coaching, you know, coaching or even training parkour athlete colleagues, you know, opening up to each other and helping out each other mm. when they're struggling. And I think that's really wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely a space. I don't know if it's certainly not the only space, but it's definitely a space where we do talk about fear yeah. and we do talk about, you know, this is wigging me out or it's generally okay to like, just like have a meltdown, you know, yeah. <laughs> and be like, I'm going to do something else. Yeah. And, and people are okay with that because they're like, yeah, I've, I've had that meltdown. You know I mean? Like yeah. the really people who are on their first day, they don't get it, but you pretty quickly get a feel for there's um, an, uh, an interplay obviously between your body, like your embodied mm-hmm. experience and your mental experience. Yeah. And if you haven't done a lot of work with embodied whatever, yeah. and you show up in a parkour class and you yeah. know, the, the class just kind of takes you and it's like, welcome to your body, yeah. you know, and <laughs> that'll wig you out pretty quick if you haven't done that before. And I think that's part of the magic sauce about what makes community is it makes, tends to force people to be vulnerable or get out of the pool kind of thing. Yeah. So. And I think people kind of It's like when there's always this sort of like shared obstacle or shared challenge, whether it be like some kind of parkour move you're trying to overcome or like coaches who are trying to overcome, you know, (laughs) the politics of the gym or on a national level, you know, like we always sort of band together, you know, together to face some sort of you know, obstacle. And I think that um, there's something very kind of intimate about that. And I I love that. Yeah. When you're, deeply interested in a topic and then you can you know endlessly argue over <laughs> which shade of red it is but when other people show up you're like it's red you know like, get out of here it's red this is red team <laughs> so yeah there's there's definitely a shared experience aspect to it okay completely different question if i call this the miracle question you wake up tomorrow morning you don't have to tell me how or why even a miracle has occurred Mm -hmm. and I want to know how the world looks different after the miracle. So you don't have to even tell me what happened, but just how does the world look different after the miracle? (laughs) Gosh, I don't know. I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll just tell you what comes to mind for me because, you know, another challenge for me is dealing with just aging and my body now showing signs of the wear and tear and dealing with injuries. So like when you say miracle happened, I'm like, (laughs) I just want like not to have like these issues that I get when I overtrain, you know, and how the world would look differently, I think is that like, it wouldn't feel so limiting in terms of like, now I feel like, especially in the last couple of years, I feel like I, my challenge is recalibrating 
sort of my container of movement. Mm -hmm. And so if I had the miracle, my container of movement would be so much bigger, Mm. you know? Oh, hey man, I was, I was just having a conversation with someone that we both know. And he asked, we were like walking his dog and he, and he asked me, let's see, how did he put it? He said, oh, I I was talking to him about human longevity. Yeah. um, We're just like talking about generally. And he said, would you live forever if you had the option? And I've thought about the question before, but my, my first answer was, well, define live. Like, yeah. you know, like, are we talking a disembodied yeah. brain? Like I have infinite thinking, but yeah. I can't affect the world. Are we talking like uh, I can speak and I can affect the world by asking or suggesting or directing, yeah. but I can't actually do anything. <laughs> and yeah. It was just like, wow, you're left brained. <laughs> you know? It was just like totally went all in. And I, so I completely understand what you're thinking. And yeah, there are, I don't want to say there are mornings, but yeah, I get up and it's like, oh, I remember when I used to be able to do. It's hard not to notice it, Yeah, you know, especially because I don't know if it's the case for everybody, but for me, it felt like, I mean, if it was like infinitesimally gradual, I think it would have been easier, but I felt like I kind of like really enjoyed, you know, being able to do things that I didn't even think I could do when I was younger. Right. And then it just sort of felt like it kind of like, fell off a cliff hmm. you know i yeah I, I went by 40 10 years ago i went by 40 and i was like no oh, this isn't so bad i mean yeah they spent it 42 that when i turned 42 i was like yeah you know what i didn't get a good night's sleep and that thing i was doing today that's not happening like i mean it's just right. all of a sudden the 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 tally sheet became yeah. like real like mm-hmm. do i really want to do this jump or do i really want to mm-hmm. try and run a mile I, maybe i'd uh, you know and I have friends who are younger than me and they're like, oh, let's stay up late or let's do something. I'm like, yep, yeah, no, nope. if I do that, then we're not doing this thing tomorrow. And yeah. it, it, on one hand, that's good because it, you know, it really forces you to face, you know, the reality of life and it also forces you to pick your battles. Yeah. But there's this whole transition period that's so confusing because, I mean, for me, it was like, wow, I can do all this stuff with my body and it's all, you know, set principle, just like keep putting, you know, putting those specific impose demands on there and get stronger and so on. And then the thing that's mystifying is that like, for me, I could train really well and do all these things that like, I could sort of set these goals and, and meet them. And it would feel good while I train, but it was the delayed after (laughs) consequence. So it's like, it's not like you're feeling it while you're training, you know, right. and that, that whole period is so confusing because you feel great while you're training and you're doing all this stuff, no evidence. And then like the next day, it's like, hold the banister and walk like you're 90 and like, <laughs> what you have know, I done? exactly. Yeah. And so, and then you got to, you know, figure out the recovery or hold yourself back when you're training, when you feel like you can just yes. do what you want. And, you know, that whole thing. But now I feel like I'm more at that place like, oh, I know if I do this, like I'll feel it. Like like now the limitations are showing up while I train. Mm. So I know how to sort of titrate it based on staying in touch with my body. But there was a period where like, even I was connected with my body, it wasn't telling me how to train properly because it felt good just like Mm. doing what my brain wanted me to do. Do you feel like... I'm going to say now that you've got some perspective on, on like that situation and like how, you know, the, the medium term, like if I do this, here's the tomorrow. Yeah. Now that you've got some perspective on that, do you feel like it's actually been freeing to like know that I literally don't even have to try to do all these crazy things that I see with my parkour vision? You can say no. No is a completely a really valid good answer. Question. I think my body knows. Like now my body really knows. Before, it didn't always know. But just because my body knows doesn't mean that, like, I'm not saddened by it. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Eyes are bigger than your... I always say my eyes are bigger than my legs. You know, like, well, I could... No, that's not going to work. In fact, just the other day, I was was visiting a friend and... Uh, he's got two little boys, one of whom is eight, another one is 10. And the... I don't know if it was the eight or the 10-year-old. Did you ever see those games? It's a plastic pvc stand with like three horizontal tubes mm-hmm. and you get these little things that are like uh the two ball yeah, bolo, yeah, yeah. and you, exactly you throw them yeah. nominally at the target yeah. and then they get hooked on the thing yes. you get points okay well they get one stuck in a tree duh go figure right so they my friend and his 
girlfriend and the two kids, they look at me like I'm magical parkour dude, right? And they're like, hey, can you get this off in the tree? Now, mind you, we're at like a beer brewery and there's like a hundred people like drinking beer and dancing to the music. So this is like in sight of a million people. And I look at it and I'm thinking, I could probably climb up there. <laughs> and like through my head ran all these visions of like, I could break the branch, I could fall and land on the sidewalk. And it like took us a couple of minutes to come up with, or we could just pick up the game toy, the little looks like a plastic ladder, and I could just hold it over my head and knock the ball out of the tree. <laughs> like when I finally figured out the answer, it was like, that was so much free. It was like knowing that I couldn't actually climb the tree, mm, like freed yeah. me from being yeah. the dumbass who had a beer and tried yeah, to climb a no, tree. Oh, you're right. Cause there's that period where we just keep, being the dumbass, you know, that's like, <laughs> I felt like I was doing that for like a year and a half, but it was still fun. I don't regret it. <laughs> so many, so many things to, do you feel like you're, I'm going to say pigeonholed as the parkour mom? Like, do you feel like, so I think the regular muggles, oh, I can't say that, the regular people have an idea in their head of what parkour is. Mm -hmm. And if people hear that about you, like if somebody says, oh, this is Maggie, she's a parkour mom, do you think that that colors how people perceive you? Like when they find out you do parkour or or do they just go, you know, shock and awe, wow? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I really, I'm really not sure how people perceive me. I mean, sometimes I've mentioned it when I've had to explain my background or something and people would be like, oh, what's parkour? And I would just explain it. But because I'm doing this project that, that I've told you about, you know, building this gym. And so I, I still feel like the parkour mom, even in that project, you know, because I'm helping them hire coaches and we're, you know, putting together the curriculums and figuring out schedules and coordinating obstacle design and all that stuff and lighting. And, you know, I just, uh, I like being in this position of helping you know, as many people as possible enjoy parkour. Like I, I, and, and this particular project being in a region of the country where there's just virtually no presence of parkour there, being able to bring it to the kids there that I know who would be super hungry for it is really exciting. And it's exciting that it's someplace, you know, a lot of these, like where I live now and these other places where I've lived, the cost of opening a parkour gym would just be so prohibitive because of, you know, real estate, commercial real estate and so on. But, you know, we have a really unique opportunity here to, to build something that's pretty big and comprehensive and it's got other really great stuff that we're doing there. And so it keeps me plugged in and I've had to reach out to get advice from so many people in the parkour community who've been so generous with their time and their knowledge. So it's been really great to learn so much. I learned so much at Art of Retreat and mm -hmm. reaching out with so many people after that event. So yeah, I I don't, I guess I don't think of myself as a parkour mom that like drops her kids off at parkour and picks them up. I think of myself as like, well, I'm a mom of a parkour athlete and it was really exciting. He, 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 he was involved in the first run of um, the USA World Chase Tag. So it was, that was a much smaller experience. Now it's gotten bigger. So that he, he was lucky that he got mm. in on the first on the one, first you know? Run. And um, so that was really fun. And it was really fun that, that some of his teammates were actually his coaches when he was a little kid. Oh, that's So neat. he's competing with along with, you know, people who were the grownups when right, he was a little kid, you know? And so it's just fun to see that, you know, that, and now, oh my God, I'm seeing Facebook posts of kids who I used to sign in at the gym and now are having babies and they're getting <laughs> married. And I'm like, oh my God, it's, it, it, it's really fun to see, you know, these people evolve and, and, um, yeah, so I really enjoy it. And that, and that, that says a lot because even if they aren't still doing parkour, we're still kind of in touch. Yes, we're still connected. It's still a, it, there's still a community, even yeah. though it's quite spread out. Yeah. I was, I was thinking there's, um, uh, there's a, do you get to a point in your life where mostly you go to funerals and you don't get to go to weddings anymore? Oh, God. Right? And then the beauty of parkour is there's such a spread of people. It's like there's always somebody getting married or people having kids or posting things. Yeah. So it's, it's really, 
I guess it's kind of a shame that I have to say that it's really nice to be part of a community where there's such a spread of age and such yeah. a spread of relationships and, and things going on. I kind of think it should all be like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's not, uh, at least not where I am. Where I am. What is... Um, I do want to also say as a mom that I think I... I can re- I appreciate from a different perspective these kids who whose lives were really very deeply impacted by parkour, mm-hmm. you know, where they were able to develop a, you know, some self-confidence and some sort of identity with kind of a tribe of people they could relate to and all that and so that's something that I um I don't take for granted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I I'm, I'm if people are listening Notice how perfectly she cut me off, and in a good way. Like, I, anytime I'm talking, we're not doing the show correctly. <laughs> but what you didn't see was I got the mom, like, hold that thought finger. You know, when your mom holds your finger yeah. up, like, I, I, I got to get this mom point it, in. It worked really perfectly. Uh, instinctively, I paused and shut. <laughs> I'm like, okay, there are a few rare moments where things should have been on video. Um, not to take anything away from your um, point, which I agree with completely. I don't want to go anywhere near fishing for like client information, but like, what is something that you think, well, first of all, do your consulting clients, people that you coach for, per, do you, still, you still, back up, Craig, and use your words. Do you still do personal relationship consulting or have you gone all in on physical training? Oh no, the personal, the the relationship coaching came after. Okay, so the, you're still doing that. Yeah, and I, I actually just literally sent an email to my last personal training client because... Um, so do your, con- do your relationship clients know that you're a parkour mom? Do they know about some parkour? Some know. Some know that I, I have that going on and some don't, yeah. Do... Can you see, like, because what I'm really interested in is what I'm really dancing or like digging around here is how parkour is woven into who you actually are. As I hit my own mic. And I'm wondering if those clients who know that about you compared to those clients who you think don't know that about you, if you can see, do they treat you differently? Do they listen a little more intently? Mm, I don't think so. I mean, I, I really think that all of my clients are kind of extraordinary in their own way. And a lot of, I mean, the type of relationship coaching that I do, you know, we actually practice intimacy. So, so it's just kind of one of my things that I do. I, I did this thing, which I'm not sure was a good idea, but I packed all my, my intimacy coaching clients on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I've got like you know, like eight hours back to back of calls, which is killing my back so that I have... That's a little tiring. I'm, I'm, yeah. My first thought was, what? Yeah. And then, but then on Fridays and Mondays, I try to keep that free so that I'm working on Kiskeya and I've got the weekend too. And so, and then I have some clients that I meet with in the evening, but I think that, I think they feel very separate to me, actually. I mean, I mention it, but they, they just... I don't know, for whatever reason, they're not really like meshed with each other at all. It's sort of like I have this life where I'm involved with the parkour community and in a parkour business, and we're building something really cool in this community that like I think will put that community on the map. Mm. And then I have this other business, which is very intimate in my office and I have kind of a routine with it and, and it's very, it's like very deeply fulfilling for me. Yeah. Hmm. Do you think that there is, have you, have you, do you find yourself, it's like parkour voyeurism, you know, like you're, you're looking at Instagram and you're looking at maybe not a particular jump, but you know, like, Whoa, I I would like to go for that hike in Scotland or I would, so there's a certain amount of voyeurism. I, I have it. Everybody else seems to have it too. Are there particular places that you think would be trans, well, the verb conjugation, that would be transformative for you if you went? Like, are there any places you're like, yeah, that'd be great, but yeah, whatever. But that one, I really feel like I should go to that parkour spot and either train with the people or work on the challenge or something. I'm just wondering if there are are like any guide stars that are physical. It's funny you say that. And I think it says, I think it says, you know, why I'm a relationship coach, but like, I don't really think of the, the, the geographical location as much as the people. The places that I want to go to are because of the people who are there. Mm. And 
like it's like the combination like oh it would be be great to go there like when my husband and I talk about you know like retirement and traveling and stuff I mean not that either of us really want to retire per se but the idea of when you're just you know the income you're bringing in is gravy and you mostly are about living your life because you know you've been saving and you know Mm -hmm. taking care of kids and so on most of the places like that people want to go. I don't want to go there unless I know somebody there. Cause to me, I'm not like, I'm not a big sightseer, you know? And even if I wanted to go to like a parkour spot, I'd want other people to be there that I know. So it really has a lot to do with knowing people at the different places that I would love to visit. And cause they're all people that I really admire. So I just think it, it's kind of like a celebrity sighting or something. Like I'd love to just go and see them. <laughs> I don't think there's a, is there a word in English? Um, sight seer is somebody who wants to see specific sites, but yeah. I don't think there's a similar word for <laughs> for people seer or groupie. Groupie. You know, that's, yeah, no, no, not, not groupie. Cool. <laughs> well, not, yeah. What made you transition away from physical training to like to uh, offloading your physical people that you were coaching for physical activity this is just like got too much physical work for you because i know it can't be easy to um well one thing is like i know this sounds weird but like there's a whole thing like i like routine and so there's this whole thing with like showering and like you know dressing up for your coaching calls and like i just and also with the kind of training that i need to do now which has a lot to do with like corrective exercise and more like trying to dial things way back and 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 I'm trying to titrate more in smaller steps like I'd like to be able to have more consistency with that and so um, what I was doing before is that I would do my other coaching business and then I was training while I was training my clients because you know during COVID it's like online. And so I'm training too. So, so I got kind of lazy about doing my own thing and just figured I'll get my movement in when I'm coaching. But I decided that I would rather have that time for myself and be able to train in the way that I want to, because my, my schedule is really pretty packed now. And so just being able to have that time now to put some breathing space around everything and have decide like how I want to train and do it my way. And you know, it's nice. Hmm. So if you had a platform with a microphone and you could give advice to people about training, (laughs) what, what is something that you see? Because you've, you've done, there aren't aren't that many people that I know of who are qualified to do both physical training and also relationship training. Those are not that they're like vastly different, but it's like the, they're not exactly the same. Those are, those are different things. And I'm wondering if you have maybe what I'm thinking is people of a certain age who do a certain kind of parkour, if there's something that you see that you could bring from relationship coaching Mm. to say to them, like, okay, that you're, you're maybe not stop doing that, but Mm -hmm. here's something you should consider that you aren't noticing about the community that you're in or that you're not in a community or. Yeah. Well, I think that there is more awareness now about, the topic of embodiment and that's really big in intimacy coaching is helping people learn to get more into their bodies because we're so in our heads <laughs> using the breath I'm laughing with right? you <laughs> and, and you know even being able to feel more empowered and making the right choices for ourselves because we have a lot of sort of social constructs and conditioning that kind of guides the way we think and being more in your body can help you sort of uncover those beliefs that may not be working for you anymore. And so I think that at least for me, you know, I probably was more kind of in my head and in my ego with a lot of my training, which might've made it difficult for me to train more smart. Mm. So, but I do know that now in, in fitness and athletics, there's a lot of more talk about, Um, embodiment and somatic work. And so I think that's a really great thing. And I think in that way, the two practices kind of overlap. I mean, even dealing with fear, it's just learning how to use the intelligence that uh, the sensations in the body to, to kind of guide your wisdom 
more than just the cognitive thoughts that are going on in your brain. I'm, <laughs> I'm nodding vigorously. <laughs> yes. That's what I love about it. So I, even though like it's, I mean, so yes, different, I mean, yes for me, like, yes, yeah. I need to go work on that. Like right now, thanks. Stop. <laughs> yeah. 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 One of the things I enjoy about having conversations with people for the podcast is different guests. I, f- I feel are like it, it's, I don't want to say it's like test driving cars, but different people are really good at different things. And you're like, you're down for fastball baseball. You do, this is not soft pitch. So I'll give you a choice, two completely different questions. You can choose either one, or I guess you could ignore me completely. So the first question is, when I got here and you were like, I still don't know why you want to talk to me. Do you still think that you have nothing to share? And then the second question would be, what question should I have asked you that I haven't gotten to yet? Oh, okay. So wait, what was the, the first? first? The first, you could choose to do one or the other or both. First question is, do you still think that you, oh. you know, the first one is I'm attacking the imposter syndrome. And the second one is what question should yeah. I have asked you that I haven't gotten to yet? I don't know if it's so much like imposter syndrome as much as like, I don't, I'm not really exactly sure who your audience is. I mean, if your, if your audience no is <laughs> largely, you know, parkour athletes, I, I don't know. I mean, how interesting what I have to say would be, but, but the question about what you haven't asked me about yet is probably about Kiskeya, this, this facility that I'm working on, which I, you know, it's a big, almost like a pipe dream of mine and I, and I love it. And so I don't know how interesting it would be, but that, that's probably something that I would be happy to share about. Well, <laughs> duh, tell me about it. Like that's the whole point. Man. Gosh, I think this must be like maybe three or four years ago now. And are we are we allowed to mention other people's names if they're yeah permission? you can oh, okay yeah so um, <laughs> I'm I'm like you seem to be dancing around names a lot. Yes, you can mention people's names. I I tend not to call out the people whose houses I stay at. Oh okay okay. It's just my personal. For some reason, I don't like to name drop where I'm staying. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> so you know how like we talked about, you go through Instagram and you sort of have your favorite parkour athletes that you're following and so on and. This was a long time ago, but I, 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 I was a really big fan of Lorena Abro. Mm. And she reached out to me once and asked if she could do like a blog interview for her blog posts. So I said, sure. And so we had this kind of interview exchange and, and then she posted our interview and, and that was my encounter with her. And then there was just this weird coincidence where... She was performing for Cirque du Soleil at the time, and she was driving from her gig there in New York to Texas, where she lived. And she decided to stop on the way at Enso Movement, which is the parkour gym here, just to train. And I happened to be there when she was there. And it was like, (laughs) you know, we hadn't met in person yet. We only met through that blog interview thing. I was like, oh, hey, you know, so like it was really exciting just to meet each other. And then she she asked the manager there, hey, so, you know, my mom is starting to have this idea of opening a parkour gym and I uh, was wondering if you would be interested in just chatting a bit about kind of like how you run the gym and stuff. And he said, well, you should actually really talk to her and point it to me because I had done some consulting work for them on some of their back end admin stuff. So she was like, oh, you know all about like, and I was like, well, yeah, I mean, probably even a bigger part of my presence in parkour is like the business side than, than actually coaching and training. So she, we really kind of hit it off talking about that. And then she had me meet her mom and her mom and I totally clicked. I mean, we just like, yeah, I mean, it was like, we just totally clicked. We're like, <clears throat> so on the same computer network in our brains, you know, (laughs) and, and, you know, so it Starbucks napkin conversation, it's like, Hey, do you want to, you know, work with us on this? And I was like, yeah, this sounds great. So we started doing kind of like the beginning kind of conceptual work on it while she, cause she had bought the land for it, but it wasn't, there was, there wasn't like a, an address yet. And it needed (laughs) a piece of land. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there was like 
permits that had to be done and all kinds of excavation groundwork and flood control and all kinds of stuff. And so it took a while to get the building permit. And in the meantime, I worked on the business plan to get the loans and stuff. So that was a really great learning experience for me. And that's how we were able to shape what this facility would be. So it's going to have an epic parkour gym. Uh, Brandon Douglas designed it and then Lorena put even more finishing touches on it. And it's, yeah, it it's so exciting. I mean, all the obstacles are going to run around the whole perimeter. So the, the, the length of the lines that can be done at height is just insane. And just, I'm so excited thinking about competitions and events and it's really, really exciting. And we have this amazing architect who is going to do a really great job. And we're also, it's also an indoor tennis facility because Lorena's mom, Rosa, has been playing tennis since a child. And so it's a dream of hers because this area in the Rio Grande Valley is like wicked hot year round. And so it doesn't have an indoor tennis facility anywhere for many, many, many miles. So she wants to create this place as really giving back to the community. It's going to also have an after-school PE program because PE is cut out of the public schools there. And then um, and a dance program. Yeah, it's just going to be awesome. So being there through all this, I mean, obviously it got delayed a lot because of COVID and everything's so expensive now because of COVID. I don't know if you were aware of things like lumber and yeah, okay. it's oh, like my, lumber it's like astronomical. what happened to the decimal point on my lumber here yeah it, i mean it's ridiculous I mean, yeah. in some ways it's like the worst time to like be buying lumber plywood to yeah. build a parkour gym you know but you know we're we're still trudging through it and i i'm really excited about this it really lights me up and and we keep coming up with great ideas on how to get the community engaged and what kind of things we want to offer and bringing on coaches and okay but, really so but where is this this is not this is so in, this is in it's in far texas which but the location is really on the border where mccallan is right but okay. what i'm getting at is that's nowhere near where, where you live are you gonna like oh, how yeah. are you gonna not rage quit your life here and move right, to there right. like how so, could you aren't you going bonkers like i'm building this thing but it's way over there well the thing that's so funny is that even when i was working at the gym that I worked at in Virginia, the first gym that I worked at, I then eventually dreamt that I wanted to open a parkour gym. And the funny thing is that like, there was another coach and we had this guy, well, maybe we had this dream, like, well, maybe let's open a parkour gym together. Right. Cause he was kind of like a head coach and ran the coaches and, and we got along really well. And we got really serious about this. I mean, we were really serious thing, thinking about this, but he was young and I thought, well, if we're going to open a parkour gym together, I really got to count on you being committed and you're pretty young, you know, and I kind of knew what he was made of. And I was like, I think you need to like take a year off and travel, just travel the world. And I was kind of almost saying it jokingly, just so that like, I know you, yeah, go, you know, go make sure. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, that was like. Oh my God. I think that must have been like eight years ago now. And he's still traveling the world. <laughs> he's like off the grid. He's off the grid. And he's and and you know, every now and then I check in and he's somewhere else. in the country. <laughs> I mean in the world. Well played. I so I, <laughs> I didn't end up opening a parkour gym with him, but like so when this opportunity came out, I was like, oh, I actually get to be involved in opening a parkour gym. And now it's like I'm learning about tennis surfaces and lighting and like all kinds of things that I just didn't even know about before. Mm. And so it's kind of fun learning all this new stuff, but I feel like the joy of it is going to be about building it and launching it. And so that I'm able to do remotely and I have traveled there and I will travel there when it opens and I will travel there from time to time. I think that like there, there, the area it has, it has its appeal and so I think the owner is thinking that maybe someday I'd want to move there. Hook Maggie. <laughs> but, you know, and I don't know. I mean, everything is kind of, my kids are getting to that age. You know, one's in college. My second one is going to college next year. And then, then I've got another one. He'll be going off to college soon after that. And then, you know, who knows what my husband and I will be doing. I think we just want to 
do adventures, you know? And that's what's also so great about my coaching business because I can do it online from anywhere in the world. So, yeah, so I... Um, but we're hiring everybody who's local there. And, and we've actually hired some people who have moved there mm -hmm. and who are already starting to work on it. So, yeah, I feel like I'm more like the wizard behind the curtain or like a cruise director. I'm not like, you know. <laughs> the cruise director several, is a nice metaphor. We have yeah. like several captains of the ship there that are really awesome that I'm working with. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Where do you see yourself uh, the First thing that came to mind is we're well, talking about the future here. So where do you see yourself in 20 years? If I ask a 20-year-old that question, they're like, huh? But, you know, I think you can think that far ahead and see where you might be in five. That's pretty straightforward. 10, a little harder. 15, a bit of a challenge. 20 might be pushing the limits of... It's so funny because I have no idea. And, you know, like I'll read a book about minimalism and think I'm just going to live in this tiny place where my husband would be like a total <laughs> minimalist and like travel everywhere and not really mm. have like one anchor point. And then like, you know, another vision, it's like, let's do all this home renovation so that our house is where <laughs> the kids come with their kids and we're going to be like... <laughs> yeah, we'll be, be the, home, like the, the home base. Home base or our extended family my brother lives a mile away with her, his kids and his kids and my kids are very close so we have kind of a like a family you know big family unit here and um so yeah i have no idea and um i like it that way actually i like i like that we're just gonna kind of decide things as we go yeah i'm not very much into convention anymore <laughs> Oh, well, then, of course, that makes me ask, uh, wait, so you were at one point into conventions by force or by parent? Like, did I your think parents? that's another reason why I was, I was so attracted to parkour. Being born in the 60s when there weren't that many Asian people here, I mean, my parents were definitely like part of that first group who just, you got to get your kids to do really well in school. And, you know, they have to, it's all about like, prestige and money and you've got to be a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman and go to an Ivy League school and just like you know that's kind of like they all had that same dream for their kids you know and I think that I had one side of me that sort of played that role and then this other side of me that always wanted to do other weird things you know so such as <laughs> oh god I've always had, well first of all like I did go to an Ivy League school but I was an art major so. <laughs> I'm rebelling quietly. Yeah. I'm not becoming a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman. And I married a white guy. <laughs> not a Korean lawyer. Your parents are like, this is not funny. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I had a career in advertising and I was a freelance artist. And then I was in that world for a while. And then I was in entertainment and cause I lived in California and then, um, and then after I got married, I was freelancing for a while and then I, in, you know, advertising and entertainment. And then I, I started a small business in, in, that was more in the world of like entertainment and events. I did um, artistic face and body painting and would do like big balloon installations and artistic balloon twisting. And this was in the DC area and it was, it was a very, it was a, it was surprisingly, it was like a surprisingly great business to have on the weekends because we were raising our kids. So I would just like dive into this thing on the weekends and my husband would be watching the kids. And during the week, you know, I was kind of like raising the kids. And um, so I did that for a while and then I got into the parkour. Hmm. Yeah. Your perspective, I love the metaphor of the wizard behind the curtain, <laughs> especially because there's a big curtain over here. <laughs> but your perspective from behind the curtain in the creation of the project that you're working on, I think my experience has been I've talked to a lot of people who are younger and into parkour, and maybe half of them, they're just in it because they love it. They want to do the thing. They want to just play, which is awesome. But a big number of them, like half of them, want to make a living out of it. They yeah. want, they want to, well, one of them is let's make a team, which means make a t-shirt. Yeah. Uh, that's a common one. Or yeah. maybe I can just jump far enough to be cool on Instagram or whatever. And wondering if you have any suggestions for, because like you're not even talking about 
this project is going to be really, I'm going to make a mint. Like you're not even, you're not even mm. talking about it from a business point of view. You're just talking about your passion and yeah. pouring that passion into the project. Yeah. And there's like a, there's a thread I've been stuck on recently about salience and serendipity. Mm -hmm. And like serendipity is partly your brain just changing what things it finds interesting. Mm -hmm. And that to you feels new, mm -hmm. but it's just your brain doing what it's always done, which is connect these dots. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if there are any insights that you might have for if somebody is thinking, I would really love to get to maybe not specifically where you are, but I want to get to this place where I'm, I have a comfortable job, but I really want it to be revolving around parkour. Mm -hmm. Like, are there some common themes you see about like, well, you could go this way or. Yeah, I think that. And this is where I think I feel a little bit maybe of a disconnect because of my age in a way, but I worked in commercial advertising for many years and I just think, I'm not saying that I'm right, okay, but I just think that there's <laughs> got to there's gotta be kind of an influx of money, you know, sponsorship and so on, like there's got to be a way to bring parkour more mainstream in order for people to be able to have careers where they could make a decent living out of it. And so I think that that's, it presents challenges because the sort of parkour ethos and history is so grassroots, you know, and so like mm -hmm. the people are creating in some ways, like the idea of making it more mainstream and commercial would change, you know, would change a big part of what's so amazing about it. Right. So I don't know, I don't know the answer so much to all that. I do know that like, at least in the Kiskeya project that I'm doing, that Rosa is a good businesswoman. And I am, I mean, if anything, I'm the one who's always like, but we got to do it this way because it'll bring more re revenue. And I'm like, I'm very, very revenue focused. And I do, I do very much want this to be something that's, that's profitable and creates a way for, and, and Rosa does too creates a way for people to have careers in, in, in these, in athletics. And it, it requires, I think it requires an investment on the part of the business owner that that is one of their missions. And that is one of ours with Kiskeya. Mm. So there's, I'm sure going to be a lot of trial and error and figuring out, but it is, it is kind of one of our missions, especially because that space and that location is going to be very um, suitable for things like very, you know, competitions and such that are on right. a bigger scale than what we've seen in the past and hopefully can gain more commercial recognition, you know. Once again, I like too many things to ask. I'm, I'm torn between asking more about that thread, but let's, let's just go another different right turn saying so it'll go a different way. I love to collect stories. People listening are fast forwarding because I always say, when you hear somebody tell a story, it gives you insight into who they are because what they're passionate about is what they want to share, share stories about. So, is, and then sometimes people want like more to skate off of, but I like the version where I just say, is there a story that you would like to share? Oh, a story. Oh gosh. I have a gross story. I don't know why, but it's like... <laughs> Uh, this but isn't this, a, is this like, isn't a challenge, but you're not going to. You you're going to totally edit this out, but I'm just going to tell you the story. <laughs> I'm totally not going to edit this out. <laughs> but I just, I just remember. I like being silly. Like I like, I don't know. Uh, I just remember one of the coaches coming to me, and he goes, he goes, somebody dropped in the urinal, and I didn't know that term what dropped meant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so like. I was like, what? He goes, somebody dropped in the urinal. Go check the men's bathroom. So I was like, okay. And I went there and I was like, oh, oh. my God, how does that happen? How does somebody decide <laughs> to take a poop in the urinal, you know? But like, that's like what I mean about like, you just see everything, you know? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's like the worst possible time, you know? But yeah, I just, you know, and then like, I wish I could remember them, but there's just so many funny stories, you know, like that people were telling each other. And I just, I still remember them now. Like, I just love that I was present there when, you know, all this like kind of funny banter was going on. But yeah, I guess the biggest thing is like, I cannot believe how many times I've had to deal with like poop and urine in running. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> and vomit. A poop cautionary urine. tale. That's like the big thing that I want to warn people who work in the office. You're going to do a lot of poop, urine, and vomit in ways that you just like don't imagine come up, you know? <laughs> You don't have. You can edit this out. <laughs> I, I have but the one thing I don't do is run an editorial in my head about what goes and what stays. We just collect and then we. See I mean, like there was one where like we could just smell it, but nobody wanted to admit who they who it was, <laughs> and it was like coming out of their pants. But we didn't want to put them back out on the floor because. <laughs> but then what do you do? How do you like ask each kid if they can like open their pants or something? But it's like, but you could smell it, and then you're like asking the kids, and then it's this whole thing of like. Nobody wants to turn each other in. And then it's like. <laughs> this is the most know? challenging movement screen a coach has ever had to run. We'll yeah. divide the group in half and you go that way, you go that way. Yeah. That's why you need a dog. You have to have a dog <laughs> yeah. in yeah, the gym exactly. at all times. Dog, we go right there's yeah. the problem. Oh my goodness. And then you find out who it is, but then you don't want to embarrass them. But you really want them to like change their clothes. Or and then, you know, at least get off the park. Oh and, you know, man. So. Now I remember why I never wanted to run a parkour gym. <laughs> Not, that's, that's, um, I mean, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but it's just it's the memorable ones. Once is too often. Mm. You you knit, don't you? Knit and crochet and sew. And so the reason I'm asking is, like, behind me is a whole like it's un, that's an understatement. Behind me is a whole wall of of materials. And do you find that your creativity, like? I never thought of myself as a creative person until I started trying to do podcasts. And then I realized that like what I say, like, like mentioning knitting, everybody just went, huh? Like, I mean, like that is a, a hairpin turn and, and we can go down. My wife knits too. I can't even spell knit. But we I'm go down. like, as soon as you said your wife knits too, I feel like we're like soul sisters. <laughs> she should come along for the, for the conversations. I think that I never realized that I was, I never considered myself a creative until I started trying to make podcasts. And then I realized that, yeah, it's like we're trying to co-create a conversation. We're trying to, I'm trying to create some semblance of like, at least, at least make a head nod toward possible takeaways to people who are listening they can, you know, sift for their own nuggets of gold. And I, I wonder if you've found that parkour is a creative outlet for you and that maybe what you were doing was too structured or maybe that's not quite the right way to put it but like you, you're obviously very organized and a very clear thinker and then when you start doing parkour we were talking i think before we pressed record about how you like doing parkour pulls you down into your body like embodiment is something you will just learn inherently and i'm, I'm wondering if you've ever thought about did parkour like open up a creative channel for you and then that suddenly yeah. appears in all aspects of your life yeah i mean i think even just to me just training parkour is like making a decision to be creative yeah i mean to me it just seems totally like a, i don't i don't really see it as i see it even probably even as more of a creative outlet than than like knitting or crochet or anything because that stuff i just follow a pattern mm -hmm. but with parkour you're kind of making it up as you go along in a way when you're you know, doing a line or trying to, trying to repeat a movement and, you know, be able to get it, that kind of thing. I think that the event that Al and I do, the summit event every year, that, that feels like an incredibly creative pursuit. And, um, yeah, and, and even, you know, building Kiske, it all feels very creative. So I think that I would just be bored. I think I would, I think that's one of the things why I stopped doing personal training. It started, it, it stopped feeling creative. It felt like I was just kind of having to keep just coming up with new combinations and stuff, but I just, it felt a little too formulaic for me. And so I stopped doing that, but I did enjoy teaching parkour. Um, and I had a low impact class that um, we stopped when COVID started and then I didn't pick it back up because I'm just um, doing this business now. But but somebody else is still teaching it. And I, I really do think that, you know, having that low impact option for parents and even kids who just don't want to, you know, kind of have all that power. Yeah. Well, everybody's at the different, then, everybody's at their own place. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I do think it's, I do think that parkour is very creative, very creative. I, I mean, when I see videos of other parkour athletes, you know, 
training. I, I, th- I think it's pure art. I really do. I look at it like I'm watching art. Absolutely. What's something that, so I'm, I'm thinking like, oh, there are so many questions that I, that are harder and harder. And I also don't want to drive you bonkers asking you really weird things. But what I'm wondering is, do you sometimes feel like you've been, do you, like, do you feel like you're pigeonholed as, oh, give that challenge to Maggie. She'll figure it out. Like, I mean, not just bodily function problems in gyms, oh, but, but, but like they're, they're also, Hey, help us build this gym or help me set up this program or help me record the, or can you organize it? Like I find that I have a certain set of skills and everybody goes, Oh, well, like Craig's the power tool for that. Give it to Craig. So do you sometimes feel like that? Oh, I, I'm doing this again. Like I don't always want to be the person behind the curtain. Yeah, no, I, I do think there, that there are definitely some gender biasy you know, in parkour, there is like there is everywhere, and, and maybe some age bias that comes up. I don't. I like being a mom. You know, I mean, I like taking care of people, and so yeah, it it, it kind of fits the stereotype that I'm the one who has the house and is hosting everybody and feeding them well and giving them a nice place to sleep when we have this parkour event, but. I enjoy doing it and I, and I enjoy being kind of an audience to everything that's going on. And I mean, the fact is I'm a lot older than everybody else here and I work my ass off to save a lot of money, you know, so I am better off, you know, I do have a bigger house. I could afford to do these things to help people out. Yeah, and it's, it's easiest if I play the role as opposed to like, well, why don't you do it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can do it and I like doing it. And I'm getting something back. I mean, I won't do anything if I'm not getting something back because then I know I'm going to get feel resentful. So it may not be obvious to everybody what I'm getting back, right. but I totally feel like I'm getting back a lot. And so I, you know, I like contributing, you know, when people have had some difficulties, I like helping out and because I can, I mean, why not? I've definitely been in that place where I had to rely on the kindness of others, you know, when I was younger. And so it's nice being in that place where you can help people out. Yeah, there's definitely a a pay it forward culture. Yeah. That comes up. Somebody once bought me dinner, like when I was in college and I I wasn't broke, but I had like a stipend and I was like, oh, I don't have a lot of extra money. He's like, let's go have some dinner. I'm like, I don't want to be a mooch, but I really can't afford to go to that restaurant. He's like, don't worry about it. Like just buy somebody else dinner one day. And and it was like, mind yeah. blown i'm like I mean, I dude that's that really place. kind you know and so and, it feels good to be the person on the other end yeah of that, well down know? the road i'm like oh i got it was not a big deal um so i i think that's it's still no i'm just thinking oh yeah but you know what now when i travel like i'm, I'm on a road trip here I really have like, it's not imposter syndrome, but when I go to somebody's house, I'm like hyper conscious of like where I set my stuff and like, did I put my shoes where they put their shoes? And, <laughs> and like, does the dog like me? Cause I don't want to be like, in, I don't want to be uh, like a freeloader or impinge no, on their space. But that's what I love is like with these parkour people, because they're not picky. They're also not too formal, Yeah, you know? So like from the get go, everybody feels like they're at home. You know, there's just, it's just there. I don't like entertaining. I don't like entertaining like formally. Yeah, with a capital E. Like, you know, and then I don't, neighbors over for wine and order. Like, it's like, you know, people are sleeping on the floor, their backpacks are all over the place, (laughs) their water bottles all over the place. And we're just like, people are helping out in the kitchen and they're playing on their guitars and they're, you know, and they're just grappling on my floor there and, you know, playing with my, massage tools and like it's fun and yeah i you know telling funny stories and stuff watching tv you know all the like channels and yeah they're watching yeah, parkour the videos or, yeah you know, oh god streaming. the parkour yeah that that's always a part of the tradition is the, yeah. like, has everybody seen you yeah like, yeah and then see like, <laughs> the whole thing yeah yeah that's always really fun it's in some sense i've i've often thought that a lot like i'm gonna say us olders a lot of what we really get out of that and enjoy, we used to have that culturally when you when we had multi generations. Like, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I had I remember my grandparents sitting at the swimming pool, you know, when we were the little kids running around, and I used to always think. 
they're not doing anything. Like they're just sitting there talking. Right. Like why wouldn't they want to sit in the air conditioning? Why would they want to sit out here where it's hot? Or why wouldn't they want to come in the pool? All these things. And now I'm like, I know what they were doing. They were sitting there having a blast. This is great. <laughs> I'm not in my house. I'm in, I'm hanging out with people or my family and my peeps. Yeah. Um, and I think that's maybe a bit of magic sauce that happens in the like the micro parkour communities, like the one you have in your house, that one that that one when it appears. Yeah. Those micro communities are better when there are people who are kind of like I don't want to say wallflowers, but kind of on the periphery, uh-huh. you know, like, oh, move the sharp things, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> like it's more fun when there's more diversity yeah. in that space. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, I, I like it when people don't feel like they have to be polite. Like, oh, is it okay if this or that or whatever? Like, I like it when people come over and they just like feel like they're at home. You right know? on the wall with a crayon. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not to say that they're not polite. I mean, everybody's super polite and really respectful and but not like formal, you know? <laughs> yeah. Stay, yeah. Stay at arm's length, please. <laughs> <sighs> Terrific. Oh, I, anything you were thinking that you wanted to talk about? You know, <laughs> I had a navigational mistake today. So you had an extra half an hour, 40 minutes to think. Was there anything that you were thinking? I hope we get to talk about something or questions for me. A lot, a lot of times I always feel bad guests often feel like they're not supposed to say anything other than unless it's in direct response to something I've said. Like you can go anywhere you want. I'll try to keep up. I do I have any questions? You could also ask questions of people who should be listening. <laughs> I I can't think of any I can't think of any that like have not already been asked and I've heard some dialogue around it, you know. I mean obviously the direction of parkour is a, you know, is a huge and big, interesting question and kind of how it might evolve after the pandemic. It's really sad that there are gyms who have had to close because of the pandemic. And, and it's really sad to hear stories about just owning a business in a city and dealing with regulations and so on, how that can really impact the business. And so I guess I just, I'm just really hoping that, you know, for those, for those who've, who struggled, if, if they're able to start getting their feet back on the ground, because I think that there are, I've heard of quite, quite a few facilities now who've been kind of busy as ever now that um, there's vaccinations and stuff. So people are coming in droves and that's kind of what I'm hoping happens with Kiskeya because I know I'm itching to go somewhere and I know that my kids were, you know, mm. I mean, just if for no other reason, just to see other people, you know, and then you <laughs> add that being able to move with them. Um, so I'm hoping that there's this kind of resurgence of movement and, and, and new ideas and, and even more connection going on after this. And so I'm, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess my question to you is what do you new, what do you think what do you think based on having spoken to people, how this is maybe going to shape up next year? Right. I thought, I, I thought you were going to let me off the hook. Okay. Yeah, I right. think, so I don't have a, I don't really have a dog in the race because nothing that I do is like physically yeah. in person, but I will, I, I will, first I'll add this data point. We're at, I don't know, a hundred and whatever. This is you know, well over a hundred recordings and all done in person. And even in COVID, I was determined to like, if it's possible, if, you know, if I can figure out a way to do it safely or a way to do it comfortably, I would still like to keep making recordings. And it, it was like pleasantly surprising how many people were willing to like figure out what was the appropriate thing to do. What was the safe thing to do? It was like, well, let's meet outside. And, Mm -hmm. and like uh, to people listening, you think this is hard to do. Trust me. It's really hard to do. You should try doing it when it's hot, you're outside in a noisy environment, there's fire trucks and you're, you're purposely like still wearing masks and we're trying to stay 10 feet apart and record a podcast. So, but that to me, I would never normally ask a guest, but like the guests were like, yeah, let's, let's do that. Like Mm -hmm. let's, or or like somebody invited me to their home, but then we, in advance, we said, let's all, let's keep our masks on. And there were all these things that we did. And the, the point I'm making is the people were so excited Mm -hmm. or so ready to like, yeah, that's a crazy opportunity, Craig. That sounds nuts. But I think that would be a really good thing to do because the world needs more. Like everybody is so looking for, what can I do? Like, can I move this thing to the left? Would that make it better? You know, like, can I move it to the right? Or can I, you know, like 
not why isn't this open yeah. but like what do i need to do to help and so i think i've seen that in the online interactions i've had in in podcasting context not in movers mindset context i've seen that in movers mindset when i'm doing recordings i've seen that in the people that i talk to which is in my personal life so i think everybody individually is like nodding you know vehemently about yes i'm i'm down for that and as far as how businesses are going to rebound i think it really depends on where like mm. where exactly you are yeah, <clears throat> so in my area true. in pennsylvania it's it's kind of more like i don't want to just say it's only been annoying but it hasn't been particularly problematic. It's okay. always been like, if you're going to go outside, okay, outside's fine. Like yeah. we don't have issues of like, I was just talking to somebody about, if you're like in New York City, if you stroll down a block, I probably walked past more people just in, cause in the buildings. I've walked by more people than live in my whole town. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a big urban yeah. center, you know, like you don't really notice yeah. unless you're really paying attention and it's a completely different environment. So yeah. everything has to be appropriate for yeah. wherever you are in the world. Yeah. And I think, I'm a big believer of of like small government and action at the small local level. Mm -hmm. Like the the federal government is literally the worst entity to be making any decisions. Mm -hmm. If it has to go to that level, yeah. there has to be a lot of reasons why, oh, I, it's because we're defending a national border. Okay, yeah. that's why it, the army should be run up there. Mm -hmm. But when when I see local communities making choices about like, how can we do this safely? Or how can we you know, do more of that or do it remotely or so I, I, I'm optimistic. I'm hoping that I'm not like wrecking <laughs> the karma by being optimistic, but I I'm seeing like all kinds of things. I'm seeing people like anybody remember when we used to go to the supermarket at three in the morning, like, why did we ever do that? Mm. And, and like the markets aren't reopening in those hours because they remembered that we, we used to stock in the off hours. Yeah. And those of us who go shopping are like, it used to be annoying to run into the guy stocking in the middle of the day. And right. So there, well, there's been like a, a reset in our thinking. Traffic's pretty much back to normal, but I yeah. think people are a little bit more aware of like, do I really want to commute an hour and a half each yeah. way to my job? Yeah. Um, so I just think even if people are not consciously thinking, I'm going to make this change because I think it's going to make the world better, just us all having to think about everything more yeah. just because people think that that it's in itself is going to be a course correcting type of thing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to say in 2022, everything's going to be awesome because who knows, like the Delta variant was a bit of a surprise. We yeah. weren't expecting that. And I, that hasn't been as bad as it could have been, mm -hmm. but maybe there's an epsilon. I don't know what's coming, but I just think, I, I mean, humans are awesome. Yeah. End of, you know, rant. And I, I really think every, Every single thing that's ever happened that's been good has come out of somebody's mind and that hasn't changed. So that's my that's my impromptu extemporaneous. Cool. All right. I think I will just say, being mindful of your time, I think I will just say, and of course the final question, three words to describe your practice. <laughs> you asked me earlier. I had them and now I can't remember. <laughs> Slow, connected and mindful, which is so different than it would have been before. But yeah, slow, I think slow, embodied, and mindful is really more my kind of movement practice now. Much more embodied, slower pace. I'm just much more mindful than I used to be with it. Thank you very much, Maggie. It's <laughs> been a distinct pleasure. I've known you for several years and we've crossed paths a couple of places and I was like, definitely to get a chance to sit down and talk. So thank you for making the time. Thank you for inviting me into your home. You're welcome.